Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. Yes, 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 ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast live. Yes, live and direct. I'm one half the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, Mashal St. Patrick Hewitt. Sorry for the delay, people. I was marking exam papers. You know how we do out here. You know how we do. Life can't stop. Got to mark them exam papers, you know, ready for tomorrow. But I'm here now. I'm here to reflect on the, the latest round of the West Indies Championship. And what an exciting round it was this round. Let, I mean, let's get this let's get this straight off the bat, okay? Before we have to get into the minutiae of who did well and who didn't do well and blah, blah, blah. Let's just get this straight off the bat. That round of cricket was probably the most competitive round of red ball cricket in the region in a long, long time. Um, it seems like it, the obvious thing is to say be, or feel like, oh, that's recency bias. You're just saying that because you can't remember what used to happen back in 2015 and back in the 2011s and 2012s. And, and maybe so, maybe so. Um, and also we, we have to remember that back in like the the, the, two, uh, the 2010 to 2015 period uh, when Jamaica dominated and then obviously when Guyana dominated and Barbados dominated and so on and so forth, maybe there was some better cricket. But we also we have to we have to acknowledge that one of the good things that cricket West Indies have done is they've got better at putting domestic cricket in the public eye. Even now, even now as I'm recording this, if you want to, um, Jamaica women are playing. Who are they playing? Actually, is it the? I think they're playing the Wimmer Islands, maybe in in uh, the T20 Blaze, right? So even if you want to right now, if you're not watching this live, you know that you can go onto the West Indies YouTube page and watch the the women's T20 tournament. So I don't think we've had it as good as this as a West Indian fan base in terms of the accessibility of our cricket, and that's why I'm willing to accept that maybe there's an element of um recency bias to say oh that was a really good round of cricket but it was in ob- objectively speaking in and of itself irrespective of whether standards were or weren't better uh 10 years ago or 15 years ago or whatever it might have been in the grand scheme of things that was good cricket um to watch hard fought competitive cricket um somebody who somebody who has access to it uh, and access to the right people find out if when the last when was the last time four regional red ball games all went to the final day all went beyond the lunch session and i think three of the four games were decided um post tea um i think the trinidad one was wrapped up in the second session we I, I don't think we've seen something like that um in a long time now we have to be careful though we have to be very very careful just because we're saying all this, it doesn't mean that that instantly translates to so West Indies cricket is strong, um, and it doesn't instantly translate to uh, we've we've identified a real core crop of players who we can think about being in international colours, and this is the return of West Indies and so on and so forth. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, I definitely wouldn't be advocating that line of argument. I think still, from my perspective, anybody you see do well who's not already an established international player in whatever format of cricket, anyone you see do well who has effectively no real international caps to their name, I think you should be first and foremost looking at them in an A-team perspective. I think we have to remember that it, there's, there's, no, there's no validity for me in just saying, right, that man did well this round, call him up to the West Indies team, which is what you tend to see that quite a lot. In, in in West Indies cricket where it, in terms of the the fan base and even in some elements of the media where a man scores a 50 or a man scores a century a guy takes a fifer and immediately people's response is calling up to West Indies that don't make no sense that don't make not one bit of sense when I say someone's done well 
What I mean by that statement is, let's now monitor their progress. That does not translate to me as instantly call the person up to, to the West Indies uh, setup. Granted, we are in, a, in, a, in an era and a period of time in West Indies cricket where one score or two scores or three scores or two fifers is enough to just get you straight into a West Indies team. And it shouldn't be like that. Those type of regularity of performances should be what we take as the bare minimum, the bare minimum to put pressure on incumbents, to put you in a conversation, not to guarantee you an instant place in any West Indies senior side. That's just me personally. And that's why, go back and watch the archives. That's why, go, go look at Go look at the last video we did. Santoki and I did a video on who should be the openers going to England, right? And if you go and watch that video, Santoki and myself both said, be very, very careful about the conversation around Mikhail Louis. Yes, the man had done well in the first three rounds. That don't mean nothing. What did he do in this round? He didn't do nothing, right? And this is why you have to stop being so quick as a fan base and so quick as uh, as media institutions to just anoint someone and say, yeah, they scored two centuries, in they come. Uh, let, let it marinate a little piece. Let's see how they develop over seven rounds of cricket. Let's not wait for two centuries and immediately go, yeah, you're ready. Man ain't ready. Let man cook still a little tiny piece before we start talking about man is ready to go to, to a big tour like England away. So said, so done. This round he struggled. That doesn't mean we write him off. We say, let the man cook some more. Let him cook some more. Let him wheel and come again. And we talk about people like that in the context of, are you applicable for A-team cricket? A-team cricket. Let's see what um, see what some of you were saying in the comments. That was just my little monologue um, to, to open up the show. I kind of needed to get that out just in case people start coming with their foolishness um, in the chat. I'm tempted to make this one a call-in. But it's ten. It's it's ten past ten in the UK, and true say I want to go to my bed before eleven o'clock. So I know how you lot done do on the call-ins. You want to talk for ages. So, anyways, let's see what you're saying in the chat. One sec. Let me just throw out who's 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 in the live today. Let's see who's in the live. Uh, Raku, let's start there. Raku says Solazano should be in the squad, and you know what? You know what, Raku? Let's start there then. Not with Solazano, but let's start with the TNT. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago versus Wimmered Island Volcanoes game. That's the first game I want to look at. So uh, the Red Force beat the Volcanoes by six wickets. Obviously, up to this point of the tournament, the Volcanoes had been the, the standout team in the tournament. But it was a very good victory and a dominant victory um, by the Red Force uh, against the Volcanoes. A well-deserved uh, victory. Let's, uh, sorry, so who batted first? Uh, Volcanoes batted first, made 1-9-1. Trinidad and Tobago made 294 in reply. Volcanoes batted much better in their second innings, but the deficit was a 100 run. They had a 103 run deficit. They made 288, which means that which meant that Trinidad only had to chase 180 odd to win the game, which they did for the loss of only four wickets. One of those wickets being the night watchman. Um, so I've I've written down some of the kind of key names we need to talk about. So before we even get to Solazano, let me take this off the screen. Before we even get to Solazano, the first person I want to talk about is Sunil Ambris. So Ambris in this game made a 35 and a 71. As things currently stand, Sunil Ambris is the second highest run scorer um, in the West Indies Championship. Mikhail Louis is still in the lead, but it's worth noting that Mikhail Louis has batted eight innings for his 360 runs. Sunil Ambris has batted five innings, which is less than pretty much everyone in the top 20. Most people have batted six, seven or eight. Sunil Ambris has batted five innings for 343 runs at an average of 67, 100, 250s. Statistically, as things currently stand, Ambris is the best batter in the tournament. Statistically, if you, if you base it on the amount of matches played and output, Sunil is technically the best batter in the tournament. Where do people stand on Sunil Ambris, though? When I when I did the video after round three, I, I raised the issue that I felt it was weird that Sunil Ambris's career had seemingly been written off. He's only 30 years old. And seemingly, he's just no... He's, when, you, when you talk about West Indies 
white ball squads or red ball squads. He's never in the conversation. But then when you look at Sinal Ambrose's career, let me let me bring up the numbers again for those of you who don't know. This is a, I said it in after round three, so apologies if you feel like I'm repeating myself. Sinal Ambrose has played 16 ODI matches and averages 36, 100, 250s. He's played six test matches. He averages 15. Okay, that's rubbish, right? But the last test match he played was in 2018. The last ODI he played was in 2021. In first-class cricket, Sinal Ambrose averages 33, 800s, 1950s. List day cricket, he averages 37, um, 100, 1650s. When you hear those numbers, tell me how many people in the Caribbean be are better than that. But for, for somebody who's only played, what is it? Where's my numbers again? Who's only played 22 um, West Indies internationals across tests and ODIs. He's got and hasn't played any tests in six years, no ODIs in three years yet has statistically some of the best records, one of the best records in the Caribbean of current active players. Never in the conversation. Never, ever in the conversation. I know there was a whole COVID thing and the jab thing and da-da-da-da-da. But when people are talking about this man should go England and this man should get a call-up, no one seems to be mentioning Sino Ambrose's name. It doesn't seem to doesn't seem to enter the conversation. So I, I, it's, it's a weird one. It's a weird one. I'm not saying he must go to England. I'm not saying that. But I'd certainly like to see him rewarded in some regard in something. He'll be rewarded in something. He's statistically the best batter in the tournament right now after four rounds. Has to be some reward at the end of that. Um, Ali Kathanae's hit, uh, hit a 50. And in our Discord group, there was a bit of chatter in our Discord group that Athanase doesn't cash in more often given he always seems to get good starts. Obviously, he had a terrible time of it in Australia. Forget that, right? We're talking about domestic cricket. Athenae's people, some of the people in the Discord were like, Athenae's lets himself down because he he looks so good as a batter and people feel that he, he gives his hand away um, when he looks like he's somebody who should certainly be scoring more hundreds. Well, I don't know where people stand on that. I just thought I'd just throw that into the mix. Uh, another person I want to talk about, Anderson Phillips. Anderson Phillip took seven wickets in the match. As things currently stand, Anderson Phillip is the second best seamer in the tournament behind uh, Jeremiah Louis. But it's worth noting that Jeremiah Louis has um, bowled in two more innings than Anderson Phillip has. Uh, Phillip has 20 wickets at an average of 14. Jeremiah Louis has 23 wickets at an average of 16. Um, People forget that before Anderson Phillips' injury in Australia, he had already made his way into the West Indies squad. When we talk about paces, as things currently stand, Anderson Phillips is outperforming Jaden Seals. So if we're talking about backup paces to go to England, technically, given that Anderson Phillips was already one of the next taxis off the rank, technically, when we're talking about Backup paces to Alzari, Shamar, Kimar, um, whoever else you lot want to consider. Is Anderson Phillip ahead of Jaden Seals? I feel like Jaden Seals would go to England regardless because remember, people, Jaden Seals has a county contract with Sussex. So he'll be playing in England prior to that test series. So I kind of feel like Seals is going to get that call up for the England tour regardless. But should there be a backup place for Anderson Phillip? What do people think about that? Um, what do people think about that? It's just, it's just worth noting. He's certainly back in form. I think it's it's, it's clear to see that Anderson Phillip is back in form. Um, Tintin says Seals is a better bowler. I'm not doubting that. I, I agree. At, 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 full, at, at, at full kind of form, and if Seals is back to his true self, Seals is 100% the better bowler than Anderson Phillip. But I'm just, rem I'm just reminding people that Phillip was the next taxi off the rank uh, prior to the existence of Shamar Joseph and so on and so forth. So we can't not talk about Anderson Phillip. Um, similarly, um, Jaden Seals, he took five wickets in the match, two for 48 in the first innings, three for 45 in the second innings. So Seals' number in the t numbers in the tournament right now, he's got nine wickets in the tournament. Where is he? Jaden Seals. He's got nine wickets, six innings. Remember that Trinidad and Guyana match was washed out in, in the first round. 
So Jaden Seals has nine wickets at 26 apiece. Um, so, I mean, Philip is definitely out bowling him. But like I say, um, Jaden Seals will, of course, be in England prior to that test series. Who else do we not want? Tion Webster. Don't know if there's any Trinis in the chat. Tion Webster hit 107. I was, I was impressed with that. That was really good to see um, from Tion Webster. People have kind of pigeonholed Tion Webster as a white ball player only. Um, he's now got in the tournament 100 and 150. In his seven innings, he's made 220 runs at 55 um, apiece. Um, good, good to see from Tion. I was about to call him a Ute man. He's 28. That, you're not a Ute man, but in West Indies cricket, 28 is a Ute man. Philip has played 20... Sorry, Philip. Um, Tion Webster has played 25 first-class matches in his career and has 300s and 450s at an average of 28. By no means am I saying that he is to be rewarded in anything, but um, it's just good to see someone who I didn't think had that in him. Good to see him scoring on beaten century. Uh, who else do I want to talk about? And Solazano, which is the first point. Uh, Jeremy Solazano, um, he hit a 70. So where are we in the replacing Tej race right now, people? Is Jeremy Solazano now in the lead in the replacing Tej stakes? He was always in the lead for me. Go back to our last video. He was always in the lead for me. I think his previous international experience, the fact that He's used, he's already got an experience of being called up to the West Indies squad and traveling with the West Indies team, although we got licked down in Sri Lanka. That composed 70 puts Jeremy ahead of Mikhail Louis for me, certainly, because Mikhail Louis is so inexperienced. Um, I'll get to Zachary McCaskey later, but I think right now, if people are saying Tej must go, I think Solazano is in is in pole position, is he not? I feel like he's in pole position uh, to replace uh, Tej Narayan Sandapur. So Solazano, just for the people know, eight innings in the tournament so far, three not outs, 293 runs, an average of 59 with two 50s. Is two 50s, is two 50s, is it two 50s? Yeah, two 50s. Is two 50s in eight innings enough? I don't know, people. There are three not outs in there. Is Solazano in the lead? Is Solazano in the lead? JT says Shandapur has to hold a drop. Okay, cool. Where, wherever people stand on that argument, cool. Who's in the lead to replace him? That's all I want to know. If if Tej goes, who is replacing him? It's not Mikhail Louis for me. Impossible. So who is who's replacing him? That's all I want to know. Corey Nelson says Tej is down bad, 100%. Tej is down horrendous. But who's in the lead to replace him? Lots of people think Tej will go England regardless. I think he's going regardless. Whether it whether it's as the backup or whether it's the as the incumbent, but can't deny that he's down bad. Um, and then lastly, uh, Jid Gooley, uh, ninety not out. Hmm. Who did who who did a video recently? Who did a video recently saying keep your eyes on Gooley? Listen to this story, people. And this is no cap. This is no word of a lie. In May 2022, this is no word of a lie. A lot of people think, I, 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 some people think I chat nonsense. In May 2022, uh, the editor, one of the editors of Wisdom, uh, Joe Harmon, got in touch with me, right? This is a true, honest to God story. He got in touch with me, sent me a letter. That's uh, the Wisdom magazine, most of you should know it. Uh, he got in touch with me and he said, Mash, we're writing an article in Wisdom um, we're going with each international side. We want to know who are the best players to watch currently under the age of 25 or 25 and under. Um, and he said, who would you who would you recommend we talk about in, in Wisdom from the West Indies? I gave him four names. This was in 2022, um, right at the start. In fact, was it May or was it early 2022? I gave him four. No, 2021. Tell a lie, it was 2021 because it was lockdown. I gave him four names. I said Tejan Raishandapur, Casey Carty, Alec Athanase, and Jid Gooley. I said those are the four batters to watch in the Caribbean. At the time when I said that, and so I gave those names to Joe. Joe sent me an email back saying, Mash, I've just looked at their numbers. They're not very impressive. Are you sure they're the four names that you want to give? I said, my guy, those are the four guys who will come good. In the West, uh, for the West Indies at some point in the near future. Tej Narayan Shandapur, Jid Gooley, 
Casey Carty and Alec Athnes. I said that in 2021, my guys. 2021. Hmm. That's all I'm saying. True story. If anyone doesn't believe me, I'll, I should bring the email up on the screen to show you lot. I should bring that email up. This is why when I say to people, make me a selector, I was seeing these guys from early, from early. And the, the, the reason I bring this up now is Trinidad and Tobago have dropped the, have dropped the ball on Jigouli. We're, we're seeing Gooley score runs now. We're seeing Gooley score runs now. And all of a sudden people are like, oh, Jid Gooley, he's such a, he looks like he could be a prospect. He was a prospect three years ago. But he's in and out of the Trinidad and Tobago team. People ain't investing in him. Sometimes he's picked, sometimes he's not. This, that, this, that. Listen, listen. Caribbean Cricket Podcast, we know what's going on out here. Trust me. Trust me, we know what's going on out here. I'm not saying that Gooley... I'm not saying that Gooley must play for the West Indies. I'm not, he's not ready for all that just yet. I am saying he should be playing some 18 cricket, though. Um, Trinidad and Tobago are taking ages to develop him, notwithstanding. I mean, look at Casey Carty. Look how long it took Casey Carty to develop from the under-19 era. Um, look how long it took Alec Athanase to develop. Remember, Alec Athanase was the top run scorer in the 2018 um, under-19 World Cup. Look how long it took him to develop, right? So you have to recognize when you see a youth man with real genuine potential, you bring them into the eight, you bring them into the 18. Bear in mind that when we say youth man in West Indies cricket, we mean people who are 27, 26. Remember, by the time they're 27, they're playing the volume of cricket that a 22, a good 22 year old is playing in, in, the, in like the top three nations. OK, so anyways, good, good for Gooley. Another score. He, he did retire her. Let's hope it's not too serious. In terms of Gooley's numbers, let me just bring them up. He is currently the fifth highest run scorer in this year's tournament. Seven innings, 315 runs um, at 53 apiece, 102 fifties. So he's, he's, he's definitely up there. Good on the one not out in that as well. Good on the Ute man. Uh, let's hope he keeps those performances um, up. Let's see what you lot are saying in the comments. 219 of you in the live. Big up everybody in the live. Thank you for joining. However, whatever time you came in, if you came in late, make sure you go watch the replay uh, to catch what was being said um, at the beginning. Uh, thank I just saw a super chat. Thank you, Frank, for the super chat. The opener spot is going to be the hottest topic after the championship games, 100%. So there's three rounds left. Uh, in fact, for those of you who don't know, sorry, let me get my diary out. Uh, for the next rounds, which obviously start on Wednesday, uh, what have we got? So we've got Trinidad and Tobago will play Barbados. Uh, that will be at Queen's Park Oval. Leeward Islands are playing uh, Jamaica Scorpions at Sabina Park. Guyana are playing the Wimmer Islands Volcanoes at CCG. And West Indies Academy are playing CCC at UE Spec. So if you wanted to know where those games are taking place, people, that's, that's where everything is happening um, in the next round. Uh, lock in, pick the match that you want to watch. And so on and so forth. A couple of people have said to me, "What's the what's the table right now?" It's not being sent to me. Um, it's not being sent to me yet, so I can't update you. But I would assume that the Leeward Islands are top um, by uh, by a few points. That's what I would assume based on what the table was like after the the third round. But I am not sure. I don't know for certain if that is the the situation. Uh, see, Martin just said, "What's the points look like?" I think Leeward Islands are top. Um, but I, I'm yeah, see, 007 says Leeward's, Leeward's top table. I would assume so, but I've not been given the updated table. Okay. Um, right, okay, let's go to the next match. What do we want to look at? Guyana versus uh Barbados. Uh b -b 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 let's go to that game. Guyana versus Barbados. So in that game, Guyana batted first, made four three six. Barbados inserted them, I believe. Um, they made four three six. And that effectively set up the game, although it was hard, it was very, very tense. Obviously, the Harp Eagles won by 33 runs. The Pride made uh, 230, substandard 230 um, in response. Harp Eagles then batted very quickly, lost loads of wickets in doing so before declaring 136 for 8 of 32 overs declared, um, which set Barbados about 340-odd to win. And to be fair to Barbados Pride, they nearly pulled it off. Um, they made 309 and fell to a 33-run defeat. So let, let, let's start with um, let's start with Shiv. Sorry, Shiv. Sorry, sorry. Let's start with Tage. Let's start with Tage. So in this uh, round, Tage made 
Okay, hold on. Before I get there, Stephen Roach says, Mash, you're putting all these men in, in the A squad. So what about the men already in the A squad? Because not half of them will move into the full West Indies squad. So what happens to them? Good question. So actually, before I um, do that roundup of Guyana versus Barbados, let me just um, look at something to remind people. See if I can find it. Uh, here we go. So the West Indies A squad that was in South Africa, which was our last A tour, had the following players in it. Josh De Silva. So he's a test player. So take him out. So you, whoever, you know what? Everyone get a pen and paper. Everyone get a pen and paper and make their notes because you have to get these. So this was a squad that went to South Africa. Get a pen and paper, make your notes, people. Josh De Silva. So we can take him out because he's in the actual test side, right? Tevin Imlak. He went to Australia as well as the backup wicketkeeper to take him out. Tejan Ryan Shandapal, he's the incumbent opener, so take him out. Kavem Hodge, he's now our number four five, so take him out. Uh, Jordan Johnson, so that's one player who may or may not stay. Akeem Jordan. Shamar Joseph, who obviously is now in our test side, so that's another one. Sherman Lewis. Jair McAllister. Zachary McCaskey, he went to Australia, so take him out. Kurt McKenzie, he went to Australia to take him out. Abijay Mansing, Jaden Seals, he's going to be a test player to so take him out. Kevin Sinclair, he's a test player, take him out. Now, the first thing that you lot should understand is this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine of the players who went to South Africa to play the 18 series went to Australia to play the test series. It was no coincidence, people. It was no coincidence that these players then went on to gel in the test match squad. They went as a team effectively to South Africa. You know, there was there was method to the madness. Anyways, the point is 10, 11, 12, 13. Of the 15 players that went to South Africa, nine of them are test players. So when Stephen says to me, so who's going into the SA squad? Well, a lot of people, evidently, because a lot of the a, the, a lot of the squad that went to South Africa went to the are in the test team, right? They went and got some cricket in. They went and play, uh, developed their game, right? Remember that what Miles um, um, Bascom said when he came on our show recently is that Miles Bascom Miles Bascom said that when South Africa come to tour um, West Indies for the Test Series, the South African A team is coming over at the exact same time. So I think there will be a lot of spaces, uh, A team spaces to play South Africa A. Um, in the summer. So I don't think um, that's going to be an issue. Kevin John, you've raised a very good point about Kevin Sinclair. Does he need to move to another franchise to enable him to bowl more overs? I'm going to come back to the Kevin Sinclair argument in a minute because I do think there is a very, very important question to be asked about Kevin Sinclair, but bear with me. So in this Guyana game, which is the one we were just looking at, right? So Tage Ryan Shanapur made 40 and 20. Um, I, if I could do polls live, I'd try and do it now. Tej is in deep, deep trouble, right? Um, what's I don't even know if I can find this guy. He's not even right. Tej has got six, from six innings this season. He scored 143 runs, no 50s, no hundreds, and he's averaging 24. This is coming off the back of a bad series in Australia, a substandard series at home versus India, and a poor time of it in South Africa. Um, he's down bad. He's down bad. Um, I don't know where people stand on Tej, if we should drop him or if we shouldn't drop him. There's three rounds more to go. Tej, I hope he scores some runs. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not, I'm not getting into the argument about whether Tej should be dropped or shouldn't be dropped right now. I just know there's three more rounds to go. And he needs to score some runs. Simple as that. Uh, Imlat made 55. Good for him. Kevlin Anderson, he's definitely an A-team cricketer. He made 87 and 33. Um, remember that Kevlin Anderson was originally scheduled to go to South Africa uh, for that A-team tour, but there was, a, there was a visa issue. So I think we can safely say that if Kevlin Anderson continues to make some runs um, for Guyana, then he will certainly be in the... Sorry, people. I think he will certainly be in an 18 conversation. Kevlon's so far six innings, 218 runs, um, 36 uh, is his average at the moment, 150, which obviously was at 87. Um, Sherwin says Kevlon Anderson should play with the test team. Nope, he should not. 
Uh, he's not ready for all of that just yet. And even if you're saying that, who's he replacing? Nonsense. Um, Kevin Sinclair. Let's get some Kevin Sinclair. So Kevin Sinclair made 72 and 25, right? So as things currently stand in the championship, Kevin Sinclair is the third highest run scorer from only six innings at bat. Sinclair has 338 runs at an average of 68, 100, 150, top score of 165 not out, which I think is the best score in the tournament so far, with one not out. And it's interesting that Guyana bat him at number six. There is no doubt in my mind that Kevin Sinclair is... In fact, Sherwin just said what I was literally about to say. I think he may well be a lock for the test team. I think. But there is a significant problem we are going to... If we get behind this notion... So this light is a lot, you know. Here we go, that's better. If we get behind this notion that Kevin Sinclair is a lock for the West Indies test side, where are you lot batting him? Are you batting him at number six? Or are you having him at number eight? To, to, to buttress what is effectively going to be uh, a, a top six that will come under significant fire in England, right? Where do you back Kevin Sinclair in the test side if you think he is a lock? Where? That's question number one. Question number two. If Kevin Sinclair gets into the West Indies test side, is it at the expense of Gudakesh Moti? Because that's who I think is, that's who I think is going to lose their place. That's why I think if Kevin Sinclair gets into West Indies test side and people say he's a lock, I think Gudakesh Moti loses his place. But the problem is this. Sinclair, for me personally, is not a frontline bowler. He's not a frontline spinner. Some people try to say he is. He's not. He's not. A frontline spinner will bowl you to victory on the final day. That's what that's what I mean by a frontline spinner. You see how like when we went to Bangladesh in that COVID series and um, uh, Jimbo took 14 wickets, a frontline spinner bowls you to a series win. You see when we went to Zimbabwe and Moti took 19 wickets, a frontline spinner bowls you to victory in favourable conditions, right? Do people look at Kevin Sinclair and go, yeah, yeah, you, you're a genuine all-rounder. Do, do you do, do you not genuinely look at Sinclair and say you are an all-rounder? Because right now what I'm seeing is a, a very solid batter. His batting might be better than his bowling, basically is what I'm trying to say here. And who, I can't remember who made that point. Um, who made that point? Where is it? Where is it? Let's see if I can still find it. What's that point someone made? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Boy, somebody made a point where they said, do you think Sinclair needs to move to another franchise to bowl more? Because the problem for playing for Guyana, if you're Kevin Sinclair, Moti and Permol will bowl the majority of the overs, right? If, if, you, if, you, want, if you want to spin a team out, you're going to turn to Vasami Permol. You're going to turn to Gudakesh Moti. You're not turning to Kevin Sinclair to spin you to victory in Red Bull cricket because Moti and Permol are significantly better than him. OK. So this is the problem we're going to face as a West Indies team. And this is why I said and some people didn't quite understand the point I was making. Kevin Sinclair is going to become our new Roston Chase. And what I mean by that is because he can bat. We will use him. So because he can bat and because he can bowl, we will use him. As a frontline spinner. Yeah, we'll use him as a frontline spinner. But I don't know how to explain this. So those of you listening, I hope you get it. We'll use Kevin Sinclair as a frontline spinner rather than picking an actual attacking frontline spinner. And then those of you who, who, who have been like in your feelings and in your emotions when I did that video about Jason Holder walks back in, Jason Holder will walk back in. Because like Kevin Sinclair, they'll look at Jason Holder and go, right, Holder offers us something with the bat which allows us to prop up what will be a weak top six or seven. Holder comes in at eight or whichever order you want people to go in. He also can bat a bit. So they'll see Sinclair and Holder as two similar all-rounders who both have the ability to bat and bowl and do bits and pieces on their day. And then you'll just play the quicks. Shamar, Alzari, Kimar. That's what I think will happen. So the person who looks like losing out in this scenario 
It's good Akesh Moti, which shouldn't be the case because good Akesh Moti should be our premier should be our premier go to spinner. It's one. Listen, if it plays out like this, just remember I told you lots so. Okay. Anyways, let's move on. Uh, the Sammy Permo took three for sixty six in the match. He also scored a ninety and twenty four. Make of that whatever you want. Make of that what uh, what you will. Um, Roach took two for 52 in the first innings. Holder took two for 52, one for 15 and scored 76. Lots of you who wanted to do the Holder slander were like, he can't bat, he can't bat. Well, he got a superb delivery from Niall Smith to get rid of him. But that 76 he made was very, very composed. He's also been batting at number six um, for for the Pride. Um, so Martin just said Holder needs to perform. So what did he do in this round? Was that enough of a performance for you? Three wickets and 76 runs. Was was that enough of a performance? What, what does Holder have to do to get back into the squad? He he certainly outperformed Justin Graves. So what does Holder have to do to get back into the squad for you? I, I, I would love to know what people want Jason Holder to be doing. Jason Holder is not a frontline strike bowler. He never has been. So what is it that you lot want Holder to do? Holder, Holder to me holds up an end and takes crucial wickets at crucial times. You don't give Holder the new ball. He's like your, I don't know, third change, second change. Um, he's, he's The role he has now for me is second or third change um, partnership breaker who also can bat a bit, which in a, in a West Indies team, which is brittle with the bat, I think that's pretty useful, is it not? Anyways, whatever. Let me not get into the debate again. Um, Jonathan Drake's good for him. He also got a century 101 runs in the first innings. Nell Smith took seven wickets in the match. Normally, um, I'd say, ah, oh, fantastic. He was very expensive, though, but he did take seven wickets in the match. Multi took five wickets in the match. Again, goes back to my previous argument about Multi is actually a frontline spinner. Um, and Zachary McCaskey, sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't move on without referencing Zachary McCaskey. So Zachary McCaskey finally showed up in the tournament. It's almost as if he realised the pressure is on. It's almost as if he realised, wait a minute, Tej's position is under threat. My position is under threat. Solazano's making runs. Mikhail Louis making runs. No one's talking about me. Well, McCaskey made an 87. I thought it was a really good 87 as well um, to put himself back into some kind of conversation. So Zachary, he knows what he needs to do. Just keep making some runs in round five, six, and seven, and you may well hold on to your position um, as the backup opener, and you may even become the incumbent opener if Tej does not make runs. Feral Francis says Jason Holder is not a genuine all-rounder. Feral, who is a genuine all-rounder in West Indies cricket? Give me name one person in the West Indies team or in, in the whole of the region who is a genuine all-rounder. Name one. Name one. Just one. And I'm not moving on. I'm waiting. Feral, name one person in the West Indies region who is a genuine all-rounder. Don't worry, I'm waiting. I'm not moving on until you can name one. And when you can't name one, then tell me who's better after that no one that you can name. I'm waiting. I'm, I refuse to move on. No, I'm waiting. Name one. Name one genuine all-rounder in the region. I'm still waiting. I feral, I'm waiting, you know. I'm not moving on, you know. I'm not moving. Let me bring his comment back up. Feral thought he could hide from me. Feral, I'm still here, you know. I'm still wa I'm still waiting. Feral, come on, man. Name one. Well, Feral, you want to hide now? Cha. Man holding up the show, you know. Feral must have logged off. So, so, so what? Feral, where are you, man? You you had this big chat, and now I'm asking you to name one. Select a bird man. Select a bird man says, Kevin Sinclair is a genuine all-rounder. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> Feral's gone, boy. Let me <laughs> let me just let me just move on. <laughs> I said, Feral. I said to Feral, bring the receipts. Feral said, you know what? 
let me just log off boy and uh, go about my business so let me let me move on then let me move on so the next match um the next match that i want to look at is um who is it uh uh, okay, West Indies Academy versus Jamaica Scorpions. Scorpions actually, Scorpions actually winning the match. Scorpions winning the match, you know. Um, so Academy batted first, three hundred and twenty-four. They made uh, going first. Do you know what? Actually, before I go about this game, how good has Sabina been across all four games so far? I feel like as much as obviously Jamaica cricket, like from an outside perspective looking in, it looks like Jamaica cricket is in the doldrums. We got no, we got no World Cup matches. We got no CPL side. Um, Jamaica Labour Party don't look like they're very interested in cricket. All of that, all of that, right? But you see that Sabina deck. It's been a real good deck for good cricket. You know, I got a, I got, I got a rate Sabina. I got a rate Sabina. It's given us some real good matches to watch. Even when Jamaica have lost and been down bad, it's still been a, a, a deck that has given us some like. Uh, it's been a good batting wicket. It's not, not just a good batting wicket, actually. It's been balanced for bat and ball. Um, if you bowl well, if you bat well, you're going to make runs or you're going to take wickets uh, on that Sabina on that Sabina deck. And I've been really impressed with the, the quality, not of Jamaica, but the quality of cricket that that pitch has served up. Probably must be because we don't see much cricket on, on, on uh, at Sabina these days. But anyways, uh, so Academy batted first, made 3-2-4. Scorpions in reply, 372. Academy in their second innings, 281, set in the Scorpions 230 odd to win. And the Scorpions chased it down um, to win by two wickets. Um, in terms of some standout performances with the West Indies Academy, Kadeem Alain, uh, obviously another very quick uh, innings at the top, 52 from 64 in the first innings. Joshua Dawn. He had a really bad time of it in the Under-19 World Cup, so it was good to see the Ute man um, do well. Um, 83 from 83, batting at number three for the academy. Uh, Jordan Johnson playing against his home nation, um, 61 runs he made. Obviously, you lot know that I've got lots of stocks in Jordan Johnson. I would like to think that come next season, Jamaica actually play Jordan Johnson and pick Jordan Johnson and don't leave him for the academy to pick or for ccc to pick jordan johnson is already good enough to play ahead of numerous people in that jamaica scorpion setup at 18 19 years old he's already better than lots of people in that top six so i would like to hope that jamaica realize this um in the following season so anyway 61 for jordan johnson um and then Joshua James again batting at number nine. He's much better than the number nine. Quick fire, thirty six down the end. Um, OJ Shields three for thirty eight um, for the uh, for the Scorpions in that first innings, um, and he was the pick of the bowlers. Now, when the uh, when the Scorpions came to bat in reply, Lug sixty four, Pete Salmon, who's been promoted to number six ahead of Abhijay Mansing, um, he made eighty one. Um, from what I've been told out of the Jamaica camp, they believe that Pete Salmon is a genuine all-rounder, uh, which is why they promoted him into the top six. Um, and then Brandon King, 77. 77 from 132 balls. Get back to King in a minute. So that gave the Scorpions pretty much like a 50-odd run lead. Academy went out like a house on fire um, in their reply. Kadima Lane again, another 50 um, at the top, another quick fire innings. Uh, Bowen Tuckett made 53, the wicket keeper. He's a very good wicket keeper, you know. I'm talking about his in terms of his actual wicket keeping ability. He made 53 at number six. And then the again, Joshua James, 36, batting at number nine. And Ned and Johan Lane chipped in at the end. Mansing took four for 70 to, to claim six wickets in the match. Good to see the leg spinner contributing. Um, obviously, in West, in, in West Indies cricket, we are. We've kind of tried with uh, Carrier and Hayden Walsh Jr. Good to see Matara, the youngster, the Bayesian youngster playing for CCC, and good to see Mansing continuing to develop in terms of uh, leg spin. So four for 70 for Mansing, and obviously Pete Salmon took three wickets as well. So anyways, Scorpions were set to 30-odd to win, and they looked like they'd lost. They were 87 for five at one stage and looked like they were going to lose the academy. But again, King... Scored another 50, 65. Kurt McKenzie opened in this match. He scored 47, uh, 65 for King. 
uh, and Man Singh 42. Once King and Man Singh came together, they basically laid the foundation um, for Derval Green and uh, Javar, Javar Royal, who are both better than nine and uh, nine and ten batters to see at home at the end. And to be fair to Green and Royal, they kind of saw it home with them with a minimum amount of fuss. Um, Joshua Bishop took ten wickets in the match. I don't know if any of you remember after round three that when I said I'd, I was naming my A-team squad and I said that I'd put Joshua Bishop in, in my squad um, for the A-team. He's definitely somebody I would include. Obviously, some people are looking at Ashmead Ned as well. So I looked at both of them after this round. So Joshua Bishop has 20. Currently, Joshua Bishop is the third highest wicket taker in the tournament. 23 wickets at 23. Uh, economy 2.86. One four for one five for. Ashmead Ned, 21 wickets at 22, two fifers. So Ned and Bishop for West Indies Academy have been spinning webs uh, throughout this tournament. They play CCC next, so you can pretty much guarantee that they're going to spin webs against CCC. Very good to see two those two slow left-arm bowlers uh, dominating. Obviously, Rakeem Cornwall is up there. He's in fourth place as usual. Um, the problem for Ned and Bishop, I would put Bishop in the 18 for sure. Uh, because I think Bishop contributes more with the bat than Ned, which gives him a slight advantage over Ned. Um, but the problem for Bishop and Ned is you've got Gudakesh Moti ahead of you, and you've also got Jamel Warrican ahead of you. Um, so I look at these two Ute men and I'm like, OK, there's potential there. We can work with it. Um, but they ain't getting into any West Indies team anytime soon. Um and if they ever did, it'd be in white ball cricket. Um, because to be fair, like as much as people be like, no, no, you've got to give the Ute man chances over someone like Jamel Warrican. So Jamel Warrican is 31 years old, right? Um, he's winning, he's winning, sorry, he's leading um the the wickets charts at the moment this season. 24 wickets at 16, one four for two fifers. He's by far the standout bowler in this year's um first class championship. And people often forget with Jamel Warrican. So Jamel Warrican in tests, he's played 15 test matches, 46 wickets um, at 36 apiece. Jamel Warrican is, to be fair to Warrican, he's no scrub, you know. We always talk about, like, when we talk about um, international spin bowlers for the for the West Indies, we always talk about Cornwall, we talk about Permo, we talk about Multi, people even talk about Kevin Sinclair. Warrican actually does a job. He actually does a job. When we won in Bangladesh um, in 2021, Jimbo took 14 wickets. People actually forget that Warrican took 10 wickets as well in, in that test series. It wasn't just down to Jimbo. Um, so I sometimes feel, I'm not saying he's brilliant, but I sometimes feel that Warrican, and I've been guilty of it myself, uh, to be fair, sometimes feel that Warrican is, his, his skill set is downplayed. So I say that in the context of as good as Bishop is, as good as Ned may or may not be, there's a lot of people ahead of them in the queue who do what they do, if that makes sense. So we just got to let those youth men just develop, um, play some A-team cricket. And I would expect that when we do see them in West Indies colours, it's likely to be in white ball cricket that we'll see them play for West Indies first before we ever see them play for West Indies in test matches. But good on the Ute man, um, all the same. Obviously, the other person we need to talk about is Brandon King. So Brandon King, his first Red Bull matches in a while um, in, the, in the domestic championship. The last time I think he played some Red Bull cricket, he scored 119 in one match, and that was it for him for the season. So 250s for Brandon King, a 77 and a 65. <laughs> Let's see how Brandon goes. Obviously, he's Jamaica's captain for the remainder of the season. Brandon has made it very, very clear. Anyone who knows Brandon King or anyone who knows anything about Brandon King, and by that I mean you actually know anything, you will know that Brandon King has wanted to play Test Match Cricket for the West Indies for a long time. Now, some of you are going to say, oh, but Mashi turned down the chance to go to Australia. Brandon had already signed that T20 contract long before Desmond Haynes and the selectors reached out to Brandon King to go to Australia. He'd already signed that T20 contract from time. No one had said to him, well in advance, we're going to pick you for Australia. By the time they turned to Brandon King, he already had his contract signed from long time uh, to go to Bangladesh or whichever down bad league he went to, right? Fundamentally, Brandon King wants to play Red Bull cricket. 
unbelievably, let me just double check before I tell you this. Um, unbelievably, if I'm right, Brandon King is going to be 30 soon. Uh, King. Let me just find him. So Brandon King is, yeah, he's going to be 30 this year, right? It is outrageous, outrageous that Brandon King is going to get to the age of 30 and possibly never have played a test match for the West Indies. And it speaks to how dunderheaded our approach is to cricket in the region. Brandon King's first class average, I don't know how many people know this, right? And remember, we're talking about West Indies cricket when I say this, right? Brandon King has played 36 first class matches. 36, you know. My guy is 30 years old. He's played 36 first class matches. This is why I say to people, this is why, it's why West Indian cricketers take so long to develop, right? Brandon King has played 36 first class matches. He averages 36, 300, 1650s. Again, similar to my point about Sunil Ambris, by West Indian Caribbean standards, that's right up there. He's never played a test match. Not one. Never even been named in a test match squad. Not one. Not one, you know. How we're so rubbish at selection. And and everyone everyone always says about Brandon King, oh yeah, but he had that breakout season for for Guyana. That I think it was a season where Guyana beat everybody and then lost in the final. And King was the top run scorer in CPL, which then catapulted King into international cricket, into to white ball international cricket. Do you know how rubbish we are at selection? Let me tell you why we're so rubbish at selection. When King got catapulted into the West Indies white ball squad off the back of that CPL season. Brandon was or he'd averaged that season, he'd averaged, I think, 48 in um Red Bull cricket in the West Indies Championship prior to that CPL season. Rather than see how Brandon went in white ball cricket and just go, you know what? Because of white ball opportunities uh, for West Indies, he's not going to play a lot of rest, um Red Bull Championship now because he'll miss quite a lot of our season due to uh, West Indies commitments. Rather than just say at the time, oh, well, let's just pick him anyways. You had dunderheaded approaches like saying, well, we need to see what he does in Red Bull cricket. This is where I'm, this is why I'm so hypercritical of West Indies selection a lot of the time. We wait for people to have to come back to Red Bull cricket to prove that they're good enough, irrespective of what they do in international cricket. It don't make any sense. And our talent pool is not good enough to be waiting for Brandon King to come back and play another four rounds of Red Bull Championship before we finally go, oh, actually, you are good enough to play Red Bull cricket. Who, who in their right mind doesn't already know that Brandon King is good enough to play test cricket? What, what, we, what, what were we waiting for? What were we actually waiting for? It don't make no sense. So anyways, with all that said and done, will Brandon King go to England? Who knows? Who knows? Because the problem is, even if he did, who's he replacing? He's not replacing Kevin Hodge. Kevin Hodge is going to keep his place. He's not going to replace Alec Athenes. They've, they've, they've decided to invest in him. But that doesn't mean you don't take him on tour anyway. So for me, Brandon King goes to England because you know you're playing a, a warm-up game. Why not? Why not? If somebody gets injured, would you like to turn to the bench and go, Brandon King is there? I would. That's all I'm saying. Anyways, let's, let, let's see. I mean, at the end of the day, there are still three rounds left, but I've already seen enough from King in round four to know that Brandon King should be in and around the West Indies Test Match squad. I'm, I'm not even talking about 18 cricket. Bypass all that. He don't need to be playing out 18 cricket. He's got nothing to prove to me straight into a West Indies Test Match squad. Never, I didn't say the starting 11. I said the West Indies Test Match squad. Um, so, yeah, that's Brandon. Uh, is there anyone else I want to talk about? No, I don't think there's anyone else I want to talk about. Let's move on. Right, last match. How long has this video gone on? 54 minutes. Boy, I've been talking, boy. Um, 281 of you in the live. Thank you to everyone who's been in the live. I didn't, at no point have I said like, at no point have I said share, at no point have I said subscribe. Now I am saying it. Like, share, subscribe. Before you go, do all of that, people. Spread the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Spread the word. All of that, all of that, all of that. Right, one more match. CCC versus Leeward Island Hurricanes. Obviously, CCC lost, but this was possibly, probably their best performance of the tournament so far. They nearly won a game. Um, 
so actually before i good question from wayne brown wayne brown says what of hope in england i don't know obviously shay is in the ipl this year um yeah good question wayne good question is shay gonna play no because he's in ipl so he's not gonna play any county cricket maybe he'll get a county deal at the back end i don't think we're seeing shay for now Unless there's some injuries, Wayne, I don't think we're seeing Shea for now. It looks like they've decided that Tevin Imlak is now the backup keeper to, to Josh. So Shea's not getting in that way. Um, and put it this way, right? Let me put let me let me put in let me put in perspective. Okay. Let me break this down for you lot. Lots of you said when I said this is how I'm now going to catch some of you out. When I said Jason Holder walks back into the West Indies 11, never mind squad. Lots of people said to me who disagreed, Jason needs to prove himself. He needs to play some cricket now, uh, Red Bull cricket back home to, to prove that he's good enough to still get into the team. Just for argument's sake, let me agree with you lot. So how comes it's not the same for Shea Hope? You can't then say to me that Shea Hope can just walk into the West Indies test squad. He ain't playing no Red Bull cricket. So what, what, what has Shea Hope done then that guarantees him a place? So all I'm saying to you lot who say that Shea Hope should go to England Keep it consistent. If you're going to come at me and say Holder can't just walk back in, then of course Shea Holt can't walk in then. He can't walk in. Because what has he done? And this this before I talk about the fact that Shea's done nothing in Test cricket. At least Jason Holder has consistently done some stuff in Test cricket. What has Shea done? Apart from the, the twin centuries at Headingley, what has Shea actually done? So, and that's not even my opinion, you know. I'm just saying... All of you lot, keep it consistent. If you're saying no to Holder, you best be saying no to Shea Hope as well. That's all I'm going to say. Hmm. Keep it consistent. Right. Anyways, let's move on. CCC. So um, CCC were put into bat. Uh, they made 2-7-3. Uh, Leeward Islands actually were, were behind the game in the first innings. 2-5-9 in reply. Then CCC then put up 301. So technically, they looked like favourites to win the game. Um, Leeward Islands were given 318, I think, to chase the game. And they actually made it with three wickets to spare. So they won by three wickets. And in the end, actually run one, sorry, relatively easily. But at one point, it looked like they wouldn't actually uh, win. Sadiq Henry, 73 in the first innings for CCC. Romario Greaves, who's actually having a good tournament. Um, he was batting at eight. He made 58. Amari Goodrich, batting at nine, made 75. Um, Daniel Durham, four for 37. Uh, Jeremiah Louis picking up another set of wickets, three for 54. Jimbo, obviously doing what he does, three for 86 in the first innings. When the Leewards came to bat, Kieran Powell led the way, 114 at the top. Every single time someone plays CCC, someone's making a century. So the next game is West Indies Academy versus CCC. Someone's making a century. And I don't say this to cuss CCC. I say it to say someone makes a century against CCC no matter what. Lots of people, have ca lots of uh, players have cashed in against CCC. Anyways, I'm just putting the facts out there. So Kieran Powell was the latest player to cash in, making 114. Uh, Greaves, again, Graves even, Romaro Graves, 5 for 63. Uh, again, having a good all-round tournament for CCC. Then, like I say in reply, uh, Yannick Otley, uh, Kjorn's brother, 99 he made. Uh, Justin Graves getting him out. And and there was like some 30s, a lot of 30s in that innings and 20s. Helped um, CCC put up 301. Jimbo took four, which was seven in the match for him. Jeremiah, Jeremiah Louis took three in the second innings, which was six in the match for him. Remember that Jeremiah Louis is, the, is technically the best pacer in a tournament thus far, 23 wickets at 16. Rakeem Cornwall is the best off spinner in the tournament in, in the tournament so far. Obviously, he always is. 21 wickets at 20. Um, so Rakeem and Jeremiah Louis did what they always do for the Leeward Islands, but they still had 318 to chase, like I say, and they were able to get there. Casey Carty 61, Justin Graves 61. And then at the back end, when it got a bit tense, Rakeem Cornwall 42, not out, and Hayden Walsh Jr. 19 not out. Uh, Matara, uh, the, the young leg spinner from Barbados, three for 71, carrying on with what looks like a very promising early career for him, leg spinner. And uh, 
Jediah Blades through for 50, uh, the pace of the left arm pacer. Um, so, so yeah, so Leeward Islands, like I say, top of the tournament, um, so or top of the table, uh, thus far. Um, let's get into the comments to see what people are saying. Uh, da, 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 da. have I missed anything? Uh, What I will just say, for those who don't know, uh, I'll post it on our Twitter handle before I go to bed. So the top five run scorers in the tournament thus far, just for those who want to know. Mikhail Louis, 360 runs at 45. Sunil Ambris, 343 runs at 69. Kevin Sinclair, 338 runs at 68. Jonathan Carter, who is now playing in that Sri Lanka Legends League, so I don't know if we should even count him. 320 runs at 64, and Jid Gooley, 315 runs at 53. Some people ask me what happened to Kevin Wickham in this round. As I understand it, there was a family bereavement for Kevin Wickham, which is why he was not in that Barbados squad uh, for the latest rounds of games. I believe he will be back uh, for the next round um, when they play uh, Trinidad. So he's currently on in sixth place with 313 runs at 63 apiece. And then with the ball, Jamel Warrican, 24 wickets at 16. Jeremiah Louis, 23 wickets at 16. Joshua Bishop, 23 wickets at 23. Rakeem Cornwall, 21 wickets at 20. And Ashmead Ned, 21 wickets at 22. With Anderson Phillip in sixth with 20 wickets at 14. So those are kind of the top wicket takers and the top run scorers um, in the tournament thus far. Listen, people. This was never supposed to go for an hour, you know. It was never supposed to go. I, I thought I'd be able to wrap this up um, in in 30 minutes, but I've been talking, 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 talking. Let's have some comments. Let's have some comments. Before I go, uh, let me just go into the live. Let's see. Let's just see what's going on. Let me just see what we're saying in terms of viewers. Okay. Okay. Not bad. Not bad, people. Make sure you like the video, share the video, subscribe on the way out. Let's write. I'm going to take the last few comments. Anyone want to throw anything in? Now is the time. Uh, Luji, if that's how you say it, says, interesting. 17-year-old leg spin again, quite a good amount of wickets. Yeah, Matara's been good. Um, Matara so far, seven innings, 14 wickets at 28 apiece, the youngster, uh, with one Pfeiffer. Um, yeah, good to I mean, Like I say, he's only 17 years old. Um, so there's a lot. Should have, well, apparently he came close to getting to that West Indies under 19 team, World Cup team. He'll certainly be in the next iteration of West Indies under 19 team. Um, Kalonji says, mention the top teams again. Do you mean in the in the table? We think that Leeward Islands are top, but I have not been given uh, the latest table just yet. So I can't tell you for certain if that's how it's set up. But I would imagine they're top. Trinidad may well be, no, because they had their game washed out. We'll share it on our Twitter handle. If you don't know about our Twitter handle, people, at Carib Cricket on Twitter. That's where you can find us, or X. Um, Andrew says, looking forward to West Sea West Indies in England this summer. So am I. I plan to be at pretty much all of the games. Um, people who are in England do try and come to the warm-up game. Um, there's a that's pretty much being treated as a West Indies cookout game. So that's going to be in Beckenham, South East London. Uh, West Indies will be playing a county select 11 in a four day match, which will be from the 3rd of July to the what is it? Get my date the 3rd of July to the 6th of July, which will be our kind of key warm up game uh, before the Lord series. So um, if you are in England and in particular in London, make sure you're there. Dare I say it, I shouldn't even be saying this because it's not fully confirmed yet, but if you are in England, let me get this word out, there is likely to be a Caribbean Cricket Podcast event on one of those days of that warm-up game. Um, we're going to be hosting, with the, we think, we think that we'll be hosting something in the evening after one of the days of that game, possibly day three. So if you're interested and you're in London, come along, people. That should be good fun. Um, anyways, any Headley Weeks games not being confirmed? I'm gonna, I'll find out for you, 007, and I'll let people know if that's what Crick West Indies are planning to do this year. Uh, Moana says, Is it, uh, is it, it is possible Sinclair will mature into a top six test match batsman? 
possible. I, I mean, that's what it looks like. And to be fair, do you know what, uh, Milwana? Um, that's what Desmond Haynes said. So as much as sometimes people criticise Desi, if there's one thing that Desi does know, it's a battle, right? Sorry. And Desi said, Desi said um, in a press conference, uh, I want to say four or five months ago, he said that Sinclair, we think, is a top six batter. What that means for Sinclair's bowling, who knows? But Desi did say that they'd identified that Sinclair is a batter in his own right. Uh, T. Brown says, Brandon King leading the XI, 11 of Red Bull players who've never played for West Indies. Yes, 100%. Uh, Kalonji says, Winwood should still be at the top of the table, even with their defeat. Quite possibly. But the last table after round three, I always... Unless I'm mistaken, Leewards weren't that far behind them. And obviously, Leewards won, Winwood's lost. All depends on the bonus points. No one knows how the bonus points works this year. Um, Kimoni says, high time for King. Yep, yeah, but who would he replace? Sheldon says, thanks for your analysis and sacrifice and present this recap match. Have a great weekend. Yeah, big up, Sheldon. Uh, long time listener of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Big up, Sheldon. Thank you for tuning in. Stephen Lane says, Hope is, a, is more concerned for the T20 World Cup. It was horrible than PSL. Good point. Um, so we're supposed to be doing, which reminds me, I need to reach out to um, Beram. We're supposed to be doing a wrap-up show of PSL and how the West Indian players got on. So look out for that because that that's something I've been keeping tabs on. So look out for that show in hopefully this week. Um I always say your name wrong. Last time you told me phonetically, and I still can't remember, so I'm not going to say it because uh, I've forgotten. How's our fast bowling stop looking? I like the look of Thorne. I didn't mention Isaiah Thorne um, in this round. He did bowl some good bouncers. I think there was a – he bowled a fierce bouncer. Who did he get out with that bouncer that I saw in the Guyana match? Oh, I can't even remember. But he bowled some really good, quick, fierce short balls. But he's still a bit erratic. So I'm not looking to talk up Isaiah Thorne just yet. He's still erratic, but there's clearly potential there. Um, uh, Kimoni says that that cap is straight fire, looks good, would look good in blue. So yeah, Kimoni, um, I don't know if you're new to the Caribbean Group podcast. We did a run, we did a run of these CCP CCP test caps. They're all gone now, though. They sold out. Um, so it's embroidered, it's embroidered stitch in there. It's a really nice finish. Um, we ship them all over the world, um, Australia, the United States, Japan, obviously the UK, shipped one to Canada. I'm sure there's some in Jamaica right now. Um, so maybe I'll do another run of them, um, Kimoni. This is my, I, I, every time we do some merch, I keep one. So this is my, this is my one of the, this is the last one that was out of the box and I kept it for myself. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, this is the last available Caribbean Cricket Podcast cap. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, blue though. The original, remember the original West Indies colors test cap was blue, so maybe that's an idea. Um, Stephen Roach says, I don't know anyone who's going to any of the West Indies matches. Stephen, well, you know me, come along. Uh, Frank says he will be there, I presume, at the West Indies matches. Frank, shout me. Um, anybody who's going to be at any of the matches, shout us. We can meet up, we can bring the sneak in the rum, particularly to Lords. Um, and have a little drink up, you know. Uh, Kalonji says the under-19 players should start representing West Indies earlier. They're holding them back too long. Mm, name one who should be playing now. Jaden Seals and now Zari Joseph, remember, played quite quickly. Early, I should say. Um, boy, you lot, as soon as I said you lot put the comments in, now everyone want to just comment like I can't go to bed. Uh, Kimoni says, I think as a standard, as a former number one all-rounder, Jason should aim for five wickets with at least 70 runs in the test. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. Although, if Jason does go to England, which he will, and if he's in our starting 11, which I presume he would be, if you have a bowling attack of Alzari Joseph, Shamar Joseph, argument say Kimar Roach, Jason Holder, Kevin Sinclair, is it, would you expect in a bowling attack made up of those five for Jason to have to get five wickets in a match? You'd like to think that Alzari and Shamar and Kimar would already take the majority of wickets. So I, I agree with you, but you have to bear in mind the, the makeup of the uh, rest of the team. Soul 4X says Lee should be on top of the group. Yep, let's hope. I think I'll get the. In fact, let me check my phone. They may even have sent it to me already. Uh, one second, people. Normally I get it on Monday morning, the latest table. Um, 
I have not, so let's wait until tomorrow. 007 says, Mash, how much time we have between the end of the World Cup and the Test Series? The World Cup ends on... Boy, it's not long, you know. The World Cup, if we got to the final... The, basically, say we got to the final, right? Or even like the final four, the Test team would already have to have flown out to England because the warm-up games on the 3rd of July. So I can imagine there's a scenario where test players who aren't in that T20 side, which is basically everyone, is it not? Because who 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 are we talking about? Jason Holder, maybe? Jason Holder, Alzari Joseph, possibly Shamar Joseph if they take him to the World Cup, and possibly Brandon King. They're the only players you would think would be going to England or have a chance of going to England. Who are who would be in the T20 squad? So they would fly later, you would imagine. Um, do you know why Keem Jordan wasn't playing? No, I don't. Good point. I thought he was just dropped, but I'll try and find out. Great show, Patrick Thomas. Great show. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. Much appreciated. Uh, Ellery says, King replaces Tej and have Kirk open with, cap with the captain. Mm. We didn't talk about that much on this show. So Kirk did make a 47 opening for Jamaica um, against uh, West Indies Academy. And then got out, if I remember, in a ridiculous way. Um, Kirk is naturally an opener. So as much as we're talking about Solazano and um, and McCaskey and, and Mik Mikhail Louis, people should remember that Kirk McKenzie is actually an opener by trade. Um, Carav Caravan Life says the top three best performing under-19 players should be part of the 18. Yep. So... Do you mean from the World Cup? So what's that like? Nathan Seals, Nathan, sorry, Nathan Seely, who's going to be playing club cricket in England actually uh, this summer. Um, who else performed well? Nathan Seely. Um, who were the standouts again? Nathan Seely. I'm missing someone. Oh, uh, Jewel Andrew, who has obviously been playing for the Leeward Islands in this year's tournament. Yeah, that, that's that's a good point, Caravan. It's a very good point. Do we want to see a Nathan Celia, Jewel Andrew, for example, in the A team? I see your point. Um, oh, yeah, dynamic one. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Ronnie. Uh, I say good evening. I'm hoping there's no more questions, but they just. What, what's going on? You lot, they're killing me with the questions. Kevin Sinclair will be the next Steve Smith. Start as a spin bowler and turn to be one of the best batters in the world. Uh, hmm. It's got a long way to go before we can say that. Uh, who's the bowler who got hold of that? Oh, that was Niall Smith. Um, who got in with the good LBW. Was it LBW? Did he not? Was it LBW? Yeah, but it was Nile Smith anyways. Nikon says, how much rope does Tej get? He's got three more rounds. He's got three more rounds to do something significant. Um, Nikon also says, who from the under-19? Oh, I just said that, actually. Uh, so Nathan Seeley and Jewel Andrew are leading the way at the moment. Um, yep, Jewel Andrew seems like the closest, yep. Palonji says Bishop and Augusta are really good. I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. I said at the time when Teddy Bishop got the call up to Australia that I was really shocked that they that they'd done that to Bishop. He's not ready yet. He's not ready yet. Um, is my view on that. Um, I don't know where Kimo Paul is right now. Does anyone know? He must have been in one of those down bad T20 leagues. But where is he right now? No idea. Um, Uh, Nathan Edward, that's why I missed Nikon. Thank you. Nathan Edward, he was good in the World Cup. Um, I knew I'd miss someone out. Um, Luje says, Mash, thoughts on four quicks against England, Seals, Rosari, and Shamar. Yes, it's a possibility. And if that does happen, that's how Holder wouldn't get in the team. So the only way I see Jason not getting in the team is if they went with those four quicks. And then obviously you'd have um, uh, Kevin Sinclair at six or seven. But it just means if that is your, if you do that, your tail is very long. Like who's number eight? Alzari Joseph. <sighs> it's a it's a long tail. Um, let's move on. Uh, Kevin Henry says Kurt McKenzie needs to sort out what's going on for a test play against him. Starts yet? But you could say, I mean, technically, I, I I agree with you, Kevin. But then technically, we could say it about everyone, couldn't we? Um, um, Jermaine Anty says it's one week. Yeah, exactly. One week between the World Cup and England. Um, T Brown says Tasia's in the chat on his burner, sweating right. <laughs> um, uh, Soul Forex says why move Kirk when he had a good series in Australia? Exactly. 
um, which is why I don't think that will happen. But I'm just saying that it's his natural position. So if West Indies wanted to think out the box and if they were like, if they decided, you know what, Mikel Louis is too inexperienced. We're not sure about Solazano. Tej is out of form. McCaskey, we're not sh- like hasn't put enough runs together. Then that would be the that would be the out the box thinking approach in terms of Kurt McKenzie. Um, Rising Bowler, big up Rising Bowler people. If you don't know Rising Bowler, go to his YouTube page. Uh, subscribe to Rising Bowler YouTube page. Um, if you want to know how I bat, you can see that on his YouTube page. Um, anyways, a big year for CCP linkups, one hundred percent. Ah, that reminds me. So also, if you're in um, the UK um, and Northern Ireland, the West Indies A team is scheduled to be in Ireland um, for the reciprocal tour. So I don't know if I don't know if any of you remember that um, that uh, what was it when the Ireland I can't remember what their team's called the Emerging Team or something came over to play our side in the Caribbean. Obviously, we beat them really badly. We're going over there in June with our West Indies Academy side. My plan is to be there, um, certainly for at least one of the matches, depending on when they actually are. That you'd think that one of them's at least on a weekend. So again, if anybody is interested in that, there's a there's a couple um, of the this there's a couple of the CCP um, supporters live in um, Ireland who will definitely be at that game. So if you're in the UK and you want to fly over for that game, hit me up because I plan to be there for one of those West Indies Academy games for sure. Um, right, last couple people. Let's try and finish this off. Um, let me give one more comment. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's go. Let's finish with this. So Nickon says, Sino Ambry's coming back. So Nickon, we addressed this right at the beginning of the show or right near the start of the show about Ambry should be in people's conversations. He often isn't. But if we looked at raw numbers and consistency, Ambry for sure should be in the show. Uh, be in the conversation, sorry. And actually, I'll give you one last comment. Kadeem Elaine, because somebody asked me about him and I didn't get round to the comment. Yes, Kadeem Elaine. Um, he's a white ball player. He's a white ball player. But if people believe that West Indies need an aggressive opener, Kadeem Elaine is certainly turning some heads. But to me, I see him as a white ball player. But that, if if I if I say that, then technically I'm I'm guilty of the same thing that I accuse other people of doing, which is pigeonholing West Indian players and not seeing the potential that they could have in Red Bull cricket. So let's just see how he gets on, you know. Two fifties, two fifties in this year's, sorry, in, in the last round against Jamaica. Let's see how he gets on if he does play in the next round. Listen, people, that was long. One hour and coming up to one hour and 20 minutes. Thank you so much to everybody who was in the live today. I think at the highest, it got to 300 co- uh, concurrent viewers. Big up everybody who jumped in. On your way out, if you haven't done so, like the video, share the video, subscribe to Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Um, thank you, as as always. Without your engagement, none of this means anything. None of, Otherwise, I'd be talking to myself. But <laughs> Maybe I was. But um, thank you, as always, people. Again, if you'd like to support the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, well, just follow us. But if you do want to support us, you can head to www.patreon.com dot com forward slash carib cricket um we always say it we've never really had a sponsor we just you are the sponsor you lot are the sponsors and that's what keeps us going i need to buy a new mic for the show so that's the type of thing that the sponsorship effectively does it just helps us better um better the product you know but thank you as always people that's been the round four review um of of the west indies championship round five like i say kicks off on wednesday so the cricket doesn't stop um if you, again, also remember that the women are currently playing the T20 Blaze. The Jamaica Scorpions women won the, the Super 50, uh, but the T20 Blaze is currently going on as well. You can watch that on the West Indies YouTube channel. We're going to be recording some content uh, around the PSL, the IPL. And there's one other thing we're going to be recording, which I'm really looking forward to do. This is for the long-time West Indies fans and hopefully for some of, you, some of the younger ones as well who may or may not know your West Indies history. We're going to be recording a show uh, looking at Lawrence Rowe and more specifically uh, looking at why it's long overdue that his ban, whatever you want to call that ban, um, should be overturned and, um, and uh, why he shouldn't be... Uh, 
I was about to say maligned. He's not maligned because everybody with sense recognizes the significance of Lawrence role, apart from possibly um, <laughs> key stakeholders in Jamaica. So we're going to look at the kind of legacy, Lawrence Roll's uh, legacy, and uh, why people in Jamaica need to do the right thing with regards to Lawrence Roll. So I've got three guests, two certainly lined up. There's one more guest that I'm trying to get lined up um, from Jamaica. And then once I've got him lined up, we're good to go. So look out for that show on on, on Lawrence Roll. Um, certainly, <laughs> when we talk about stylish, stylish batters, certainly Yaga is is right up there. For those of you who've never seen him play, just go watch the archives. I never saw him play, but go watch the archives. Those who did see him play, they say Yager is always up there. So anyways, people, look out for that. Look out for that. Caribbean Cricket Podcast content doesn't stop. More coming this week. I'll be Mashal St. Patrick Hewitt on half the Caribbean Cricket Podcasts. Thank you. And good night. We rule the cricket world. Now the rules. Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans.